Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video, we will be previewing double game week 26. Discussed today will be, should we be captaining Salah or should we potentially be considering captaining Trent? Should we be using the bench boost chip or should we be using the triple captaincy chip? What is our general chip strategy over the upcoming game weeks? And we'll also have a bit of a discussion around the best strikers at the moment in the game because let's be honest, none of them are particularly good. If you're enjoying the content here on this channel, please do make sure to like, comment and subscribe. But without further ado... Let's jump into today's video. So guys, before we jump into today's video, I just want to give a massive shout out to Ultimate Champions who will be sponsoring today's video. Ultimate Champions is the first free to earn fantasy football game powered by the blockchain. What I want you to do, as I always say, is imagine a cross between FIFA, trading cards and fantasy football. And there you have Ultimate Champions. You basically collect rare forms of different cards as NFTs or non-fungible tokens. You build the best team you possibly can with those rare cards. And the, the better they do in real life, the more points you earn and the more points you earn the better the possible rewards and these can be financial or in the form of packs and further players as well as well as opening packs and getting players that way you can also trade with other managers on the market and get the players that you want and that's where that sort of trading card element comes in as well at the moment the beta is not quite live but they are finalizing the final few teams there are lots of championship teams league one teams scottish league teams as well and further teams and leagues will be added over the coming weeks and months i'll be honest guys as i've said i am actually very very excited by this project i am in their current discord server as well i'll be creating content around this in the discord server and i'm just very very excited to be involved with this so what i'm going to do if you want to get involved with this early which is definitely the best way to do it i'm going to leave two links down below the first link will be to their discord server as i said i am in that you can get notifications as to when different things go live and also competitions around getting some packs before the game actually goes live and potentially an og role on their server as well and the other link i'll leave is to their twitter account so if you want to follow them turn on notifications and get updates around when the beta does eventually go live and when different teams are being added you can do so as well like i said definitely worth getting on this sooner rather than later thank you to ultimate champions for sponsoring today's video but without further ado let's jump into discussing double game week 26. So guys, we're going to jump straight into what I think will be one of the most heavily debated questions of the game week, and I know has already been discussed extensively in the FPL community, and that is, should we be captaining Salah? Is Salah the obvious captaincy choice, or should we be looking at alternatives? Should we be looking outside of Salah? Because recently, Salah's form hasn't been amazing. He's obviously been worked very hard at AFCON. Potentially, he'll be rotated. Is he as good as he was early in the season? I know there are a lot of questions around that, and there is a brilliant alternative in Trent Alexander-Arnold. So for these first two sections, we're going to go on into depth in loads of different statistics and looking at whether we think Trent possibly could match Salah or whether we're just overthinking it and we should be captaining Salah instead. I've tried to, to approach this in some different creative ways rather than just looking at underlying statistics because obviously we know Salah will come out on top of most of those because he's an absolute monster and his underlying statistics are fantastic. But Trent's also got a little bit about him. So what I thought would be an interesting thing to do to start with is to separate the season according to almost like double game week periods. Now I know Black Box did this last season so it's not completely original idea but hopefully you'll enjoy it in this context so what i mean by that is rather than just looking at how many points they score on average per game week what i've looked at is assuming that each set of two game weeks was a double game week how have they performed across the season what this gives you an idea about is rather than just how they perform in a one-off match each week how they perform across a span of two game weeks at a time and i think it will give us some quite interesting results so starting with game weeks one and two imagine that, that was a double game week you can see salad did score that 17 points in game week one but across the first two he did blank against burnley for a three pointer so in game weeks one and two salad scored 20 points and in game weeks one and two, Trent scored 18. So across those first two games, we treated that as game, double game week one. Very, very close, but Salah does just come out on top. We know Salah started the season absolutely on fire. If we then go to the second double game week, game week three and four, Salah scored 18 points and Trent scored 16. So again, outscoring Trent by two points, but he did manage to keep up quite well with him in those first like two double game weeks or those first four game weeks. It then started to dip for Trent. But what I would note is that in both of the next two double game weeks or set of two fixtures, Trent didn't play two of them. So he didn't play Crystal Palace at home in game week five, and he didn't play Man City at home in game week seven as well due to injury. So I wouldn't necessarily take this with, I would take this with a pinch of salt, I should say, the second set. So the third double game week, 19 points for Salah, one point for Trent, and that one point was against Brentford. But who knows? They obviously, Liverpool kept a clean sheet against Crystal Palace in game week five. So we can assume Trent probably would have got a minimum of six or seven points there, in which case it wouldn't have looked as bad. And then in the fourth double game week, game week seven and eight, 
Salah scored 26 points. He got two back-to-back 13-pointers. In that period, obviously, Trent didn't play the Man City game, and then he got a six-pointer against Watford. So across the first four, definitely Salah coming out on top, and that extends to the fifth double game week. Game week's nine and 10. Salah scored 29 points. Now, this was the game week nine Havertz gate when Havertz blanked, and Salah scored 24 points against Manchester United. Trent did score 10 points in that game week, but then he only followed that up by one point the week after. So... I guess you can actually separate the season into almost two blocks. Up until game week 10, if you took that as five double game weeks, Salah did outscore Trent in all five of those double game weeks. What I would say is that the first two, it was actually very close and Trent put up a good fight. Game weeks five and six and then seven and eight, because Trent missed a couple of games, it's very, very difficult to gauge how close he would have got to Salah there. But we can definitely say that Salah was on fire. Again, if you take those first 10 game weeks as five doubles, 20, 18, 19, 26, 29 for Salah. So he's averaging over 20 points per double game week if you treated them as that. Whereas Trent's getting 18, 16, 1, 6, 11. Even with missing games, you would definitely say that at that early stage over the first 10 game weeks, Salah comes out on top as the double game week monster. When we move on to the back end of the season, though, even in the lead up to AFCON, it's a different story altogether. So in game weeks 11 and 12, Salah actually scored 13 points. So immediately following that Manchester United Hall, he scored 13 and 11 and 12 against West Ham and Arsenal, whereas Trent scored 27 points. He got a 12-pointer and a 15-pointer against West Ham and Arsenal in consecutive weeks, which is absolutely massive. So if you captain Trent in either of those weeks, you would have been amazing. And again, if we treat that as a double game week, 27 points for Trent is absolutely outrageous. It's almost as good as Salah's best, whereas 13, again, is pretty consistent for Salah, but it's not mind-blowing there. If we then move on to the next set of fixtures, Salah once again comes out on top with 21 points in game weeks 13 and 14 versus Trent's 11 points so again Salah is now sort of six out of seven he is coming out on top but then in the two after that Trent comes out on top in both scoring a very very consistent 18 points in both whereas Salah scored 14 points and then 10 points so like I said in the sort of four double game weeks following that absolute monster haul by Salah in game week nine Trent actually comes out on top on three of them and you can see his average is very very high 27 points 11 points 18 and 18 So it depends what parts of the season you're looking at, I guess. And then just before Salah went to AFCON, both of them actually struggled across Game Week 20 and Game Week 21. Salah scored seven points. Trent scored six points. Across AFCON, Trent actually scored 12 points in that double game week. But of course, Salah wasn't there. So I've just put NA here because it's it's not worth making a comparison when Salah didn't play any minutes. And then in the last two game weeks, while Salah only played 30 minutes in game week 24, he has, of course, scored four points, whereas Trent has got two back to back clean sheets for 12 points. So hopefully I didn't ramble for too long there. I guess the point of this I'm saying is that if you take sets of two fixtures at a time and you imagine that all of them were double game weeks, Salah definitely comes out on top for the majority. So the first five he came out on top, he then came out on top for game weeks 13 and 14 and then also game weeks 20 and 21. But what you can see in any two given weeks, Trent definitely has the ability to match Salah across any two weeks. But generally speaking... Salah's coming out on top. So it is a bit of a tricky one. I guess the point of this is to show that Salah isn't definitely the obvious choice. And when people say that there's no way that Trent could outscore Salah, just refer him to game weeks 11 and 12. I know that is framing and that's picking a very, very small sample. And that generally speaking, you would expect Salah to outscore him. But even game weeks 15 and 16, game weeks 17 and 18, you can see that Trent, when he gets a clean sheet, he also tends to get bonuses and an attacking return of some kind. And even if he just gets two clean sheets, which is very, very likely in game week 26, he's likely to get potentially as a minimum of 12 points so I do think that Trent's a fantastic option but across the season then if we take them as sets of double game weeks Salah is averaging 16.45 points per double game week Trent is averaging 13.09 points per double game week so there's not actually that much of a difference across only a set of two fixtures again if you if you just times that by two for the double game week that wouldn't be that much of a difference we're looking at about six or seven points difference between the two So I still think that Trent is a decent option. This didn't necessarily put me off of Trent. What it does show is what an incredible start to the season Salah had. But since around game week 11, I would say it's been fairly consistent. Trent comes out on top, then Salah comes out on top, then Trent just about comes out on top for the other two, then Salah comes out on top. So from the back end of the season, when Salah's not lost form, but he's definitely dropped off slightly with his statistics and his output... I think it's actually fairly close. So at an early stage, we would say Salah probably comes out on top, but it's fairly close. But we're not stopping there. We've got some other things to look at when comparing Salah and Trent.
So what we've got here is just a few extra interesting stats around the Salah or Trent triple captaincy discussion. I should say this isn't just triple captaincy. If you're using the bench boost, as we'll discuss in a second, this is also just captaincy as well. So the first one, which was I thought was really interesting. Now, remember that both of Liverpool's games in game week 26 are at home. Salah is averaging 8.08 .08 points per 90 at home this season. Trent's actually averaging 8.56 points per 90 at home. So Salah's outscored Trent. Salah's underlying statistics are probably better than Trent. But if we look at home fixtures in particular, Trent's actually outscoring Salah if we look at output, which is really, really interesting. And I do think that with fans back in the stadium as well and starting to see some trends in home and away fixtures for different teams, I do think it's worth looking at home and away. And Trent, at the very least, you would say is matching Salah. But across the season, he's actually outscoring him. So that might actually work in Trent's favor. And again, I guess what I'm trying to do here is just give you reasons to potentially look at Trent. I'll probably be captaining Salah myself, and I'm not trying to convince you to not captain him. But what I like is I like independence of thought. I like critical thinking and I'm not I like not succumbing to things such as group think and herd mentality and I like challenging the status quo and I think in doing this we're at least raising the potential for some of you that want to to go outside of Salah so that would suggest that potentially Trent could be a decent option he's outscoring Salah at home this season when we look at how many times each of them have blanked at home this season Salah's actually blanked in two out of 10 home games this season so he's played 10 games at home blanked in two of them Trent's played nine games at home this season he's actually only blanked in one now, technically, he banked in, blanked in two of the games, but in one of them, he got two bonus points and two appearance points. So he actually got four. So I've counted that as a, an attacking return of some kind because technically four points, I guess, is a return. So you could say he's either blanked in one out of nine or two out of nine. But essentially, both of them don't usually blank at home. So across the double game week, you can expect both Trent and Salah to get at least an attacking return or a clean sheet for Salah of, uh, of uh, or a clean sheet for Trent of some kind across those two fixtures. Realistically, considering the fact that it's Norwich and Leeds, you could probably expect at least two returns for both Trent and Salah across those two games, which is very very impressive for for uh, in, with respect to consistency. And the third point is that away from home, Norwich rank 18th for expected goals expected goals per 90 Leeds rank 12th for expected goals per 90 so from an attacking perspective Norwich are one of the worst teams in the league Leeds are sort of actually mid table for expected goals per 90 alternatively they rank 20th and 19th respectively for expected goals conceded per 90 so I guess the point to draw your attention to here this is actually back in favor of Salah is that they're both they're bad both teams are pretty bad from an attacking perspective and they're both pretty bad from a defensive perspective but if we're looking at what Norwich and Leeds are worse at i.e. defending or attacking the data would suggest that they're actually pretty bad at defending so 20th and 19th they are the worst two teams in the league from a defensive perspective away from home that would, for me, make me lean back towards Salah there. I know Trent also has attacking output, and that might make you lean towards Trent. But with Trent, you're also wanting those clean sheets. And with the fact that Leeds are actually 12th for XG per 90, Norwich are 18th, which again isn't great, but it's not 19th or 20th. That would make me think that potentially Salah's the one to target here, especially as, again, this is at home, and we're looking at away from home statistics. So they're just a few extra things to hopefully spark some d debate and also to, to fuel your insight. For me... I actually think there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that Trent could be a very, very good captaincy shout, but I haven't seen enough to convince me to go away from Salah. And I just think when I look at explosive potential across the season, when we looked at those double game week scores across sort of two fixtures, Salah had two or three scores greater than Trent's greatest score. And therefore, I think at their very top of their game, at the top of their ceiling, I do just about prefer Salah. The final thing that I would say in favor of Trent is that Salah's just played like a thousand minutes at AFCON or whatever it was. He's played a lot of football. He does look slightly tired. And they also have a cup final and uh, the Champions League sandwiched either side of the Norwich and Leeds game. So I think for me, there is a reasonable chance that Salah's hooked early in one of those games or potentially starts one of those games on the bench. If that is the case, you've got to say that there's a very good chance that Trent outscores Salah because there aren't just there aren't any good alternatives for Trent at right back for Liverpool. So I think Trent will play 90 minutes in both or at least 80 minutes in both. And I think there's a reasonable chance Salah might be rested in the Norwich game if I had to bet which one. Don't let me don't let that put you off. Obviously, make your own decisions on that. But I'm just giving you, again, a few reasons to potentially consider something else. And I think it's important to critically think and not just go with the flow and think about are there potential other reasons that you might want to go for Trent. So all of that being said, hopefully that was a nice discussion for you. If you are considering Trent, hopefully that might have given you some reasons to. If you're considering Salah, I still think he's a great option. I'll be honest, it's probably one of those where you just trust your gut feeling and go for it. It probably comes down to risk appetite as well because Salah is going to be massively owned, massively captained, and also massively triple captained. Trent, I do think, will be owned 
been capped in by a lot of people, but it's going to be significantly lower than Salah. So if you're someone that just wants to protect rank and you're not particularly risk seeking and you're potentially quite risk averse, I'd go for Salah. If you want to have a bit of fun with it, I do think Trent's a fantastic option. So let me stop there. Let me know down below. Are you captain in Trent? Are you captain in Salah? The potential option now is do we triple captain, which we're going to look at in one of the future sections as well. So I want to get on to discussing probably the second most controversial discussion this week or the most interesting one, which is around should we be playing potentially our triple captaincy chip or maybe our bench boost? And I thought it would be good to just preface that with going through what I think are the two optimal strategies from now on if you have all of your chips. Of course, if you don't have all of your chips left to play, then you need to adapt this strategy. I can't through, go through all of the possible permutations because there are so many different chips and so many different combinations of what you might have left. But assuming you have all of your chips, these are my two favorite strategies and I've given these two as my favorite because one involves a triple captain in 26 and one involves a bench boost in 26 and I'll explain the reasoning around that and then we'll jump on to having a bit more of an in-depth discussion around triple captaincy and bench boost for game week 26. So the first strategy is probably the one that I'm deploying and the one that I'm most interested in at the moment and this involves triple captaining Salah in game week 26. It then involves free hitting in 27. Now the reason I'm potentially free hitting or personally will be is I'll likely have at least two Arsenal players. I'll have triple Liverpool. I'll have two potentially two Everton players against Manchester City. I've got Josh King against Manchester United. It's a really, really terrible week for my team. And I know this and I'm perfectly happy free hitting in 27. So free hit in 27. I've then got the second free hit for either game week 30 or game week 33. It largely depends on how big that blank is in game week 30, how many players I have for that, and also how big the double looks like it will be in 33 and whether I feel like I can navigate that without the free hit. If you only have one free hit, you can still deploy this strategy. You've just got to decide. You've only got one free hit to play between game 27, 30, and 33, and that will be team dependent. If you need it in 27, play it in 27. If you don't, I would probably suggest not being overly aggressive. Keep the free hit and maybe play it in around game week 30, game week 33 instead. The idea then is to navigate 27, 30, and maybe 33 of the free hits. Wild card after double game week 33, around what? game week 34, game week 35, and then wildcard into a bench boost 36. The reason for the wildcarding into the bench boost 36 is game week 36 is likely to be the biggest double game week of the season. It's likely to be the week where we have the FA Cup fixtures rearranged. So the, the blanks in game week 30 are likely to be rearranged into 36. So we could potentially have as many as about 12 to 14 teams doubling in game week 36. Therefore, I think if you wildcard into a bench boost 36, you can potentially get 15 doublers with really good fixtures and a strong bench for game week 36, and then potentially have a good team for 37 and 38 as well if you concentrate on your transfers after that. So I think this strategy for me is working quite well. You get the best of both. You get arguably probably the best triple captaincy choice of the season in salary or, or Trent against Norwich and Leeds at home. You then get to free hit in 27 and be aggressive. You get a second free hit in either blank 30 or double game week 33. You can wildcard perfectly into a bench boost and set yourself up for the back end of the season. So that's strategy one. The second one is wildcarding in 28. Now, the reason that I like this is a couple of reasons. Number one, I feel like you get the bench boost out the way, and I do think the bench boost can be a slight hindrance. As you can see, I'm completely adjusting my strategy based on wanting a bench boost 36. So you could potentially bench boost in 26, dead end your team into 27. And what I mean by dead end your team is you can sell Salah, Trent, Jota, Ramsdale, whoever you want, because you're going to wildcard in 28. So you can take a minus four or minus eight, sell some of your big players, maybe sell Salah for Fernandez, Son or Kane or Ronaldo, dead end into 27. Don't need to free hit in 27 as a result. You then wildcard out of that mess in game week 28. You can then free hit in blank game week 30 triple captain in the slightly smaller double game week 33 and then free hit in the massive double game week so you know you won't get 15 players in game week 36 no you won't bench boost but you can have basically the perfect 11 in what is likely to be a very very nice double game week so i also really really like this now what i would say is you can quite easily change strategy too so that rather than being bench boost 26 wildcard 28 you can make it triple captain 26 wildcard 28 and then you can still bench boost in 36 the reason I prefer it slightly like this is, like I said, I prefer to bent, to wildcard into a bench boost or to wildcard just after a bench boost. The benefit of wildcarding into a bench boost is you can set up the bench boost perfectly. The benefit of wildcarding after a bench boost is you don't have to stress out about having a particularly strong bench or having lots of depth. You can have one strong first sub, a decent second sub, and then maybe just a dead third sub. You don't have to stress about having loads of money tied in your bench, so you can pump more money into your starting 11. So for me, these are the best two possible strategies. And as we will say in the next section, I think if you're wildcarding in 28, I do quite like the bench boost in 26 for that reason. I think if you're wildcarding later in the season, I think it makes more sense to wildcard 
card into a bench boost for game week 36. Let me know down below as always. Let me know what your updated chip strategy is. As I said, I'm personally leaning towards strategy one. This list is not exhaustive. And if you have different chips available, your chip strategy will change. But as always, let me know in the comments down below. So moving on from that discussion, specifically into bench boost or triple captain, it does come down to quite a few different things and I can't give universal advice. So here are just a few things that I'm considering. Building on what we just said around chip strategy, when do you plan on wildcarding? I don't see any reason why you would wildcard late if you're not planning on bench boosting late. The only real benefit of wildcarding in 34 or 35 is to attack double game week 36. Of course, if you're not bench boosting, then you can just free hit in 36 and attack it in that way. So the only reason you should really be saving your wild card is for that bench boost. So if you're thinking in your head, I want a wild card around 32, 33, 34-ish, maybe even 35, then that probably tells me you should save the bench boost. If you're thinking, I'd like to wild card in 28, then again, it might be best to just play the bench boost now because you might wild card in 28 and you might not even be set up for a good way in, for the bench boost in 36. Yes, we've got a lot of teams doubling, which means it's likely that you'll have quite a few doublers, but your team might just not be set up in a way. You might have injuries, you might have rotation. It might be that you're just unlucky enough to pick players from teams that aren't doubling in 36. So for me, it does largely depend around when you plan on wild carding. The second point, is whether you think there'll be a better opportunity for either the bench boost or the triple captaincy in the future, or potentially even so, do you think it will massively alter your strategy on your transfers, having to navigate and try and build for a bench boost in the future? There are a lot of people that just hate the aggravation of having a bench boost, and that's why a lot of people played it in game week one, because they feel like you actually end up negative points because you're so worried about building a bench and changing some of your keepers around and changing out injured players because you've got to have 15 fully fit players that aren't being rotated. So... There are so many things to consider about the future, but like I said, I, I personally don't think there's a much better opportunity to triple captain in this season. I know we don't know about the future, but Salah and Trent, who are basically the two best performing players this season and in past seasons in FPL, playing against Norwich and Leeds at home in a double game week, I don't think you'll get many better opportunities than that. When I look at the bench boost, do I think we'll get better opportunities to bench boost in the future? I do. And yes, it might involve me having to keep my wild card a bit later or maybe take an extra couple of hits. But when I think you can get potentially eight fixtures, eight fixtures on a bench boost if you're doing it in a double game week versus now, you're probably likely to have a maximum of five or six. But I, I would assume most of your bench boosts will include just single game week players. So when I look at the upside of it, I think that there won't be many better opportunities to triple captain, but there might potentially be better opportunities to bench boost. So that's something to think about for yourselves. And like I said, also though, if you just don't fancy fluffing about at the back end of the season and stressing about the bench boost, play it now. Get it out of the way because triple captaincy, you don't have to plan for it. You just make sure you've got the best captain that choice. And when you're feeling brave and when you're feeling like it's a good week for that player, you play the triple captain. So it involves a lot less planning. So I don't mind people that just want to get the bench boost out of the way, but do think about future opportunities. And like I said, I think the future opportunities will be better for the bench boost than they will be for the triple captaincy. And then the third and final thing is just something to really bear in mind is because this isn't a massive double game week, yes, it's quite a big one, but because there are quite a few teams having single game week fixtures, how many of your players are single game week rotation risks? Now, I would argue that as many as two is probably too much to play the bench boost. The reason I say that is if those two players are indeed rotated and maybe don't feature at all, I mean, we saw it with the likes of Cancelo, Laporte, um, KDB as well. I know these are all Manchester City players, but it happens outside of that as well. If you've got players in your team that just don't feature, normally your bench would just come in for them. So what you've got to be what you've got to be confident of when you pay the bench boost, I guess, is that all 15 of your players are at least going to play. Now, hopefully they start, but just in some form that they're going to play. Because again, if you've got quite a few single game week players, there's just the opportunity that one of them will miss out through a random little injury, little niggle, potentially illness, or they'll just be rotated. Whereas when you're playing a bench boost with 15 double game week players, it's very unlikely, unless there's a long-term injury or some sort of long-term COVID issue, that one of your players will miss both of their games. Hopefully that makes sense. With a single game week, you, you run the risk that someone will be rotated and miss out. And then you've basically ruined, the, not ruined the bench boost, but you're much less likely to get anything from it because then those players would have come into the starting 11 anyway through automatic substitutions. So hopefully I've made my point clear there. These are three things that I'm thinking about when I'm bench boosting. Rather than necessarily the specific player that I've got on my benches, when do I plan on wild carding? because that will affect it. Do I think there are better opportunities in the future for triple captaincy or bench boost? And also, am I sure that all 15 of my players are going to play? And in and around that, once you've answered those questions, hopefully you'll have a better idea around whether you want triple captain or bench boost. Me, myself, as I said, I am wildcarding late. 
I plan on bench boosting in 36 and therefore I'm 99.9999% sure that I will be triple captaining a player. Whether it's Salah or Trent, we're still not sure yet, but it will probably probably be Salah. As always, let me know down below. You bench boosting in 26, you triple captaining in 26, are you potentially wildcarding, free hitting. Let me know what your current chip strategy is for game week 26. So the final section today is going to be discussing the strikers in FPL at the moment and what we can possibly do to get strikers in that might end up returning. Now, the reason I've called this best of a bad bunch is that realistically, none of the strikers are performing at the moment. So I can't sit here and say, listen, pick this player because they're scoring lots of points at the moment. What we can do is take a glance at things such as price, the amount of minutes they're getting, underlying statistics, and also fixtures, and try and predict who might be the best value over the coming game weeks. Now, a lot of people are leaning towards a 5-4-1 formation or a 4-5-1, and I don't disagree that that could be a fantastic method for moving forward. But the issue is that there aren't many cheap strikers that you can fill your bench with. I've got Broyer on here, potentially Adam Eder. They're the only real ones that play and are cheap. And so I don't think you probably want to fill your bench with Broyer plus two 4.5 million pound strikers because in doing so, you're going to have a very, very, very weak bench and you might need that bench in future game weeks. So as I said, I'm going to go through each player individually, talk about their price, talk about their underlying statistics and their fixtures, and I'll explain whether I think they're worthwhile. You can see I have got three players with stars next to their names. I'll discuss why that is in a second. So if we start with Broyer... I'll be honest, Broyer is one of the players that I want the most. And you can see he's got a star next to his name. The main reason for that is that the fixtures are really good for 26 and 27. And of course, 27, a lot of people aren't free hitting. So it'd be good to get him in. They're also good from 28 onwards. So he has great fixtures. He's also 5.3 million. Like I said, outside of Adam Eder, he's probably the best budget option or the cheapest option you can get in your team. And there isn't really anyone else in and around that price. He's also passing the eye test massively as well. What I would say is the underlying statistics aren't mind-blowing. So what I do like is 5.1 touch in the box is highly impressive. 0.35 non-penalty expected goals per 90 is impressive. It's actually the joint best on this list. But his expected assist is virtually non-existent at 0.01. That puts his non-penalty expected goals and expected assist at 0.36. So if you're not particularly interested in the stats, we're saying that he's predicted to get or expected to get just over one expected goal involvement, goal or assist, per three games which isn't terrible for 5.3 million, but you're not necessarily expecting that much from him on the back of that. What I do like, like I said, is that his goal threat is one of the highest on this list. And I think at 5.3 million, with good fixtures being fairly now, passing the eye test and decent underlying statistics, Broyer is definitely in my top three, probably in my top two options if I were looking at strikers to bring in this week. After that, we've got Pookie. Now, Pookie's actually been ticking along fairly well. He's actually one of the top scoring strikers in FPL this season. The main reason for that is he just plays so many minutes. He's very consistent, and at the very least, he's sort of racking up those appearance points and the odd goal and assist. His underlying statistics are appalling, and the fixtures are terrible as well. So P Pookie's not an option for me, but I just wanted to show you that his statistics are terrible. Obviously, when you take penalties into account, they improve slightly, but 0.22 non-penalty expected goals plus expected assist per 90 is by far and away the worst on, the list, on this list. Like I said, fixtures aren't great. Norwich aren't great. I would not be considering Pookie myself. Josh King's the third one. Josh King's actually got very, very good underlying statistics. He's got the joint second best non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90. I won't go into too much detail on Josh King, but the fixtures aren't terrible. He does double in 26. And if you are looking at the underlying statistics, he's got exactly the same expected goals as Broyer, but he's got 0.16 higher expected assists. So considering he's only 0 0.6 million pound more than Broyer, if you're just going off the underlying statistics and also the fixtures are decent, King's actually probably a better option than Broyer. The reason I haven't got him started and the reason I'm not going for him is I do think it's worthwhile using common sense and taking into account context. And Josh King is not finishing well. He's not finishing his chances. And also Watford looks significantly more defensive under Hodgson. So whilst I am someone that uses rationale, whilst I am someone who uses the, the analytics and looks at statistics, I also use a bit of common sense and I use a bit of eye test as well. And for me, whilst Josh Josh King's underlying statistics are great. I wouldn't necessarily advise anyone to bring him in. What I would say is I have Josh King in my team at the moment and at 5.9 million, I think there are other priorities to potentially remove in our teams than Josh King. For example, Dennis. Dennis has got significantly worse underlying statistics than King. That's why he's not even on this list. So for me, I wouldn't necessarily advise King, but he's still a decent enough option at his price. Edward's the fourth one, and it's really annoying because Edward's statistics are actually, I would say, probably top three, top four on this list. You can see lots of touch in the box, Good expected goals, good expected assist as well. That puts his non-penalty expected goals and expected assist at almost 0.5. So we're looking at almost an expected goal involvement every two games, assuming he plays 90 minutes. But of course, that is the big issue. 
with Elise, with Edouard, with Ayu, Mateta, Zaha, there's so much rotation in that Crystal Palace team up top. And Vieira has shown that he's not afraid to rotate that front three or at least that front sort of four players for Crystal Palace. And as a result, as good as Edouard looks, his statistics are only good per 90. Not only is he, does he never see out 90 minutes, he gets subbed around 60, 70. Sometimes he doesn't even start. So realistically, when you're looking at someone's statistics per 90, they need to play 90 minutes or you need to consider what they are like when you reduce to the amount of minutes they're playing. So that's why for me, Edouard's probably not an option now. We've just seen a little bit too much rotation in recent weeks. Seeing him benched recently as well. For me, I'd rather go for someone now because even if their statistics aren't good, over that amount, over extra minutes, you'd expect them to rack up quite a few points. The next player on the list is Veghorst. Now, he has only played 255 minutes, so the stats are going to be skewed positively. We see it a lot when players first come to the Premier League. They'll have great statistics for a few game weeks, and then it'll drop off slightly. But they are quite promising. They're sort of similar to Broya, but with slightly better creativity. We're sitting at around a 0 0.52 expected goal, uh, expected goals plus expected assists per 90, which is very, very good. Also, Burnley do have the double-double. So, Assuming Veg Horse is fit, which I don't know at the time of recording, if he is, if he isn't fit, apologies for having this in here. But if Veg Horse is fit, I do think he is one of the best options at the moment, purely for the double double. But also, I think the underlying statistics are good, and he has looked decent. His finishing wasn't great in the Liverpool game, but I still think he is a very, very good, very good option. And at six point five million, I don't think you can go wrong with a talisman. It's going to play ninety minutes with four fixtures in two game weeks and some decent fixtures from twenty eight onwards. The sixth player is Mope. Now. He's someone that's been ticking along nicely and I was considering him for game week 25 and I thought maybe he's even good for 26 and beyond as well. But when I actually look at his underlying statistics, they're not very good. So 0 0.29 expected goal, 0 0.1 expected assist, not that many touch in the box compared to other players on this list. His expected FPL points aren't that great. Ninth best fixtures in the Premier League over the next six game weeks. So I don't mind Mope. He is ticking along and I do think you can do significantly worse than Mope such as a pookie looking at underlying statistics, but he doesn't blow me away. There aren't that many fixtures to, re to rearrange. And as a result, I think I'll be looking at other players outside of my pay myself. We've got St. Maximan as the next player. Decent underlying statistics, but not out mind blind. Similar to Mope, but he's just got a slightly higher expected assist and slightly lower expected goals. The fixtures also aren't that fantastic for Newcastle. We're looking at sort of 19th over the next six game weeks. So for me, again, St. Maximan's an exciting player to watch. And I do think that Newcastle should do fairly well over the back end of the season, having made a few new signings. But for me, I just think there are better options. Specifically, is he 6.9 million? When you look at it in comparison to Broya, and he's got a similar sort of statistics to Broya, I'd much rather just go for the 5.3 million man with better fixtures and also passing the eye test as well. The next player on the list is someone that has started to creep back into our thinking. Obviously, got the goal in game week 25. That is Raul Jimenez. Now, he's 7.4 million, so he is quite expensive in comparison to some of the cheaper players here. Decent statistics, I guess. He's getting a lot of touches in the box, but his non-penalty expected goals is 0 0.24, which really isn't great. If anything, his underlying statistics actually look slightly worse than St. Maximan. So I think the great thing about Wolves is that they've got the first, the best fixtures in the Premier League over the next six from an attacking perspective. They've got a double in 26. They've got a decent fixture in 27. And they've also got good fixtures from 28 onwards. So I do like Jimenez as an option for all of those reasons. But when I look at the underlying statistics, I don't think that necessarily Jimenez is the best option here. So similarly to St. Max, I don't mind him as an option, but he's not for me. I've got Watkins on this list, really disappointing. And I'll be honest, I've spoken to a few, a few Villa fans. They're actually quietly confident that Ings might start the next game or potentially start one of the future games as well. So whilst Aston Villa don't have terrible fixtures, and whilst I do think Gerrard is starting to get something out of that Villa side, it appears that Watkins is not one of those players that is performing well. You can see across the season, it's a 0 0.36 expected goal involvement per 90 and non-penalty expected goal involvement but he's just not performing that well like I said he looks a bit disinterested at the moment I wouldn't be surprised if Ings comes in for him for the odd game here and there and just even if he doesn't his per 90 statistics just aren't that great so unfortunately I love Ollie Watkins as a player but for me he's not really an option at the moment and I know some Watkins owners are even potentially looking to sell him ahead of game week 26 which when you look at the underlying statistics I can't really criticize Similarly disappointing is Antonio next. But as you can see, Antonio's statistics across the season are very, very good still. What I would say is that they are massively skewed from those sort of first five or six game weeks when he was getting around one expected goal involvement per 90. They're still not bad over the last five or six game weeks. He's actually got similar expected goal involvement across the season to Jared Bowen. He's just had a bit of bad luck and also some poor finishing here and there as well. Whereas Bowen has just been finishing absolutely everything. So Looking at this, I'm still considering selling it. We'll, we'll talk about this in the team selection video later in the week. But I'm still considering selling Antonio. But when I look at this, I think, am I making a mistake? Because the underlying statistics are pretty good across the season. 
he just looks a little bit fatigued. He looks a little bit lethargic and he looks to be lacking confidence. So in a similar reason to why I said I'm not suggesting King because I, I use common sense, I take into account eye test. That's the other reason I wouldn't recommend Antonio at the moment. And I wouldn't necessarily have an issue with anyone selling him. But if I am referring to the underlying statistics, he's got the best non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90 on the list here. And whether that's skewed by the first few game weeks or not, across a 25 game week span, that is still highly impressive. So Antonio is definitely worth one to monitor. And if you feel like you want to keep him or you've got other fires to put out, I don't think it's necessarily the worst issue. The issue you've got with Antonio is that he doesn't have any games to be rearranged. And from 28 onwards, the fixtures are actually quite rough for West Ham. So again, I don't mind selling him for those reasons. And I will likely be looking to offload Antonio soon. Calvert-Lewin's the next one on the list. He's actually only played 590 minutes this season due to injuries. But in those 590, his statistics have been slightly underwhelming. The only reason that his underlying statistics look good at a first glance and why you can see his expected FPL points per 90 are quite good is he has had three penalties in that time. Scored two of them, missed one. So those three penalties massively skew his expected data. That's why we look at non-penalty expected data. And looking at non-pen expected goals and assists per 90, it's actually 0 0.37, which isn't that great at all. So Calvert-Lewin, another one. I wouldn't mind you holding him because the fixtures at least in the immediate term, aren't bad. But as you can see, they're actually the worst in the Premier League over the next six. There's some tricky fixtures in there, but they do have three good fixtures to be rearranged. So similar to Antonio, even similar to Watkins, I guess, they're not the worst holds in the world, the worst holds in the world, but I wouldn't necessarily be targeting Watkins, Antonio and Calvert-Lewin with my free transfers. And then the final player on the list is someone that I'm actually considering for my own team, a little spoiler for the team selection video, but do tune into that later in the week. I'm actually considering Lacazette. Now, Lacazette's statistics are actually very, very strong. He should be fairly now because obviously Aubameyang has left and we have Martinelli is suspended for at least the first game of double game week 26. Smith Rowe definitely isn't favoured at the moment in the starting 11. So I would hope and expect Lacazette to start the majority of the games. And as you can see, statistics are very strong. 6.33 touches in the box per 90. 0 0.28 non-penalty expected, expected goals per 90 isn't great, but he does also take penalties, so that could be boosted by the potential penalty. 0 0.2 expected assist per 90 is the, the joint most creative player on this list alongside Antonio. That puts his non-pen expected goals and expected assists at just shy of 0 0.5 per 90, which is the fourth best on this list here. So I actually think he's a pretty good option. Eight best fixtures in the league. Like I said, if you are free hitting in 27 as well, what you get with Lacazette is you get a double in 26. You don't have him for blank 27 anyway because you're free hitting. And then Ben Crellin said it's quite likely that the Chelsea-Arsenal game will be scheduled into game week 28. And therefore, the Arsenal and Chelsea might both have a double in game week 28. So what you might potentially be getting from Lacazette if you free hit in 27 is a double-double in 26 and 28. And as a result, I actually think that Lacazette's one of the best options at the moment despite being 8.3 million. So hopefully you enjoyed that. I just looked down 12 minutes of talking about the, the, the strikers at the moment. I, I keep saying budget by accident, but the reason for that is I haven't included, obviously, like Ronaldo, Lukaku, Kane, etc. on here. The reason for that is, yes, you might not include them, but they're not worth the value at the moment. They're not worth what you're paying for them. And I think, if anything, we should, we should be probably taking money out of the strikers at the moment. If you are going to go for a premium striker, I think Kane is probably the best option. So if I run a wild card right now, or if I could pick the ideal full, forward three moving forward... I would probably have Broyer, Veghorst, and Lacazette. I think Broyer's fantastic value at 5.3. He's the best budget striker. And you could bench him at that price. I think Veghorst for the double-double, if he is fit, again, if he is fit, this is, if he is fit, he's got the double-double and decent fixtures moving forward with still two fixtures to be rearranged. And I think Lacazette might have a double-double and has great fixtures from 28, on, um, from 28 onwards. So those would be my three. Let me know down below. If you had free choice of any of the strikers in the game, who would be your front three? Again, you might even want to go even cheaper. You might want to go like Broya, Veghorst, and like a 4.5 million pound striker and have that player as your third bench. I do think that the value is definitely in midfield and defense at the moment. As a result, I think with Broya, Veghorst, and Lacazette, you've taken money out of your strikers, but you've still got three strikers at three different price points, which allows you that flexibility moving forward. So guys, the final thing I wanted to draw your attention to today is that I have indeed created a Discord server for my channel, for the FPL community, and for F any FPL manager to discuss whatever they want with other FPL managers as well. So stick around for this because I do think it'll be one of the coolest resources and coolest places on the internet at the moment to discuss FPL and non-FPL stuff. So the point of Discord is that it's essentially like a group chat, but you can separate into different channels. And in doing so, you don't have one cluttered group chat where lots of different things are being discussed all at once. So it's almost like an organized group chat. So what we 
we've got is we've actually got quite a few FPL channels, and then we've also got some non-FPL channels in there as well, which I think is super cool. So starting away, you've got a welcome. So if you slide into the server straight away, we'll give you a welcome. You can introduce yourself. You can see there's also a get role, so you can let everyone in the server know what team you support. Outside of that, there are quite a few fancy Premier League channels. So you can see you've got an FPL chat where people are just talking about general FPL stuff. You've got a rate my team channel. So if you want some help with your team, as you can see, people put their team in here and they get some feedback for that. You've got captaincy in here as well. So if you want to discuss about different captaincy options, we'll have some captaincy polls. That's great here. So if you want to discuss Trent versus Sally, you can discuss it in there. We've got some team news stuff where we share some good team news, potentially early team leaks as well. There's injuries, there's stat bots where you can get different things. You can play like football wordle, but there's different stats you can get based on different simulations, expected goals, etc. There's also our Rap Tier 1 private channel. So if you become a Rap Tier 1 member, you can do so by clicking the join button or clicking the link in the description. If you become a Rap Tier member, you can have our private channel. There's around sort of 30, 40 of us in that in there. We all chat about FPL and therefore it's more of sort of a, a private channel where you can get the opinions of a few trusted managers. And I'm obviously most active in the Rap Tier 1 chat as well. Outside of that, there are loads of miscellaneous channels. You can see there's a football channel in here. We've got an F1 channel. So if you want to discuss Hamilton and whatever it may be from F1, you can do so. If you play FIFA, there's some people discussing foot, etc. There's general gaming. We've got a food channel as well if you want to put pictures of your food in there. We've got fitness if you want to post pictures of your runs. There's support. There's music sharing, memes, face reveals, charity giving. We've got a book club where people are sharing the books that they're reading at the moment. We do have a Wordle channel. So if you want to share your Wordle scores with other managers, you can do so as well. And we've also got some different voice channels as well. So if you want to chat with other FPL managers, you can. I guess I just wanted to just show you this and let you know that there's this cool place where you can discuss FPL with other managers. And if, if you're looking for that level of interaction that you can't potentially get on social media or in real life with your friends, you can join our Discord server and in doing so you can hopefully chat with other like-minded FPL managers. So I'll probably pin my the link in a comment down below. If I do forget to do so, the link is in the description. It'll be like the fourth link. It will say, join our Discord server here. You click that link. All you need to do is create a, create some sort of account and then you click the link accept the invite and that's it. You don't even need to download it. You can just use it on your web browser. So you don't even have to download the application if you've never used it before. So please do join the Discord server. Again, link will be in the description. Maybe it's a pinned comment as well. And if you do join, say hello. As I said, get into the, introduce yourself, make sure you let us know who you are and then get chatting FPL and non-FPL. And I can't wait to have you in the server. So guys, there you have it. That is my Game Week 26 preview. Hopefully you found it interesting and enjoyable, the discussion around triple captaincy, bench boost, Salah versus Trent. Also a bit of discussion around chip strategies and the best strikers at the moment in the game as well. If you are enjoying the content here on this channel, please do remember to like, comment, and subscribe. As I always say, those three things are completely free for you to do, but they help support the channel massively. And if you also want to join our Discord community, make sure you do so. And if you want to become a member of the channel, make sure to click the join button or click the link in the description, become a member, enter our private channel and get to know all of us on a, a more informal basis as well. Later this week, we'll also have the team selection video. So do keep an eye out for that. Make sure you subscribe and turn on notifications to see the team selection video. And we'll also have a live stream, which is on Thursday evening because I'm unavailable on Friday and Saturday. So we're gonna have a Thursday evening Q&A live stream instead of the normal deadline stream. Until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching. Cheers.